So my background is in part global sustainable development. And if you had told me five years ago that I would be doing what I do today and that it would turn out to be one of the keys to reversing cycles of poverty, I don't think I would have believed it. And yet here I am having learned so much and I have to admit that the question that I learned of that opened this whole process was one so hidden in stigma that not many people have asked it at all until the last few years. So I have to give myself that. But let me share with you the journey. So I've been helping the Clay Foundation in Kenya provide more sustainable education opportunities for secondary school, a gift that less than 8% of the population ever got to achieve. And it makes such a profound difference. We were finding sustainable ways for the community to enable themselves to offer this. While there, a dignitary asked us if we'd like to visit the slums of Kibera. The slums stretch on when you're at the top like a sea of rusty corrugated metal. And it's filled with resourceful people, millions packed in spaces so small. And they invited us to go see an orphanage there. And I was, of course, really worried that my heart would break. But I toughed it out because I believe in experiencing. And when we got there, instead, they captured my heart. And since I couldn't adopt all 400 of them, instead, I brought them my gift, sustainable options. So one of them that I have to share with you is a rocket burning stove. Do you know these? So they're, they enabled them to, instead of using scarce wood that was very expensive in the slums, they could use sawdust in these simple metal stoves that could then save them hundreds of dollars a week that could then be used for food. So I was really excited about this and frankly very proud of myself, I, I'm sorry to say. And I thought I found my passion in life. This was it. I was going to help orphanages be more sustainable, livable, and a little less crowded. But that was before the election violence of 2008. Do you remember this? Right after the first election? Machetes and fires and people displaced and killed. And suddenly that way too big orphanage that had 400 children turned into an unimaginable 1,400. And I have to say reported because I still can't imagine how they could possibly fit that many people in this space. This is one of the rooms there. So I went to bed trying to think of ways to feed them better because after all, this was friends of friends gathering together and passing the hat to find ways to help. This wasn't my orphanage, but I wanted to help. So we were looking for ways to feed them better. And one night I went to bed with that inside me, worried about their hunger. So imagine my surprise when I woke up at 2.30 in the morning, not with questions of solar lighting and solar solutions and food, but this question, have you asked what the girls are doing for feminine hygiene? I hadn't even thought of that question. It had never occurred to me. It was on none of the lists of any of the solutions I sought for and enabled. I was stunned and I flew from my bed and ran as fast as I could to the computer to email this question. And to my surprise, got an immediate answer. And the answer? Nothing. They wait in their rooms. How do you wait in your room when there are 50 people in the room with you and these are stacked end to end and they keep going on? How do you do that? The answer was they sit on a piece of cardboard. And it turns out that all over the world, if women and girls want the dignity of being free from their room, if they want to participate in education or supporting their family, and not being without hygiene, they have to resort to things like leaves and newspaper and trash or unsecured um, cloth or leaves, I said that already, <laughs> corn cobs, corn husks, bark, stones, anything to not have to stay in their room because they are not there by choice. I knew I had to do something. And I wish I could tell you that my first response was something innovative, but it wasn't. It was to provide disposable pads. 
After all, that's what I was familiar with. So I found a nonprofit that provided them for just $200 for 500 girls that needed them. But I also knew something. I knew that if I even found a way to find somebody every month to donate something that was disposable and they needed food, they were going to choose food every time. And that, too, turns out to be true all over our planet. Days for Girls started not in that moment, but in one to come. You see, amazing volunteers joined together and sewed pads, and sewed bags for those pads and made thousands of components for those 500 girls, all stitched with love. In fact, three of them sewed so fast and furious that their fingertips bled. But we made it, and we took eight huge duffel bags to Kenya, and they were so grateful when we got there. I'm the one with the cheesy grin. <laughs> but they have more to teach us. I'm embarrassed to say that it didn't occur to me that there was no place to dispose of these disposable things I'd sent, right? So the consequences were that there, every chink in the chain link fence along the latrines was filled with soiled pads, and they were packed against posts, and they were filling the pit latrine that had to be shoveled with, by hand. And that, of course, adds to health issues and stigma against women and girls, the very thing we were trying to avoid. There was no place to dispose of them. But they had more to teach us besides their love and gratitude. As some of these girls left, they said, thank you so much. Before you came, we had to let the teachers and principal use us if we wanted to stay in class. I hoped that didn't mean what I thought it meant. And yet there were another 250 girls waiting to come through, and so I couldn't stop, but it turned out later that evening, I learned it was exactly what I feared. In order to not be bound to their rooms, on a piece of cardboard going without even food or water, unless someone remembered to bring it to them, they had to be exploited. It was a choice they made, because if you drop out of school and you're an orphan, your consequences and opportunities almost all include being exploited. If there were only 10 girls who could say that change for them, everything we've done would have been worth it. Instead, because of amazing grassroots of thousands of volunteers that stretch from New Zealand to Australia to Europe, all over Canada and all over the USA, a magnitude of more than 100,000 girls have been reached in five years. So that applause should go to all of these amazing people, but they did something else that is equally as astonishing to me. You see, we started asking questions. We started asking, how does this work for you? And they would explain things like, that um, we made our original style. In fact, you have to be with us six months before you can see them. So if you want to see the original style, you have to come volunteer. We made them with ribbons at the end and a pad that looked like a pad. And of course, we made them white because that's what pads are, right? Well, it turned out that the girls told us, you know what? When I walk, the pad shifts forward and then it sticks out and I look like a man, like a man. <laughs> OK, cuffs. We'll put pockets at each end. We got this. <laughs> then they explained that they had to hide their pads underneath their bed because they, wouldn't, they would be embarrassed to hang them out. Or in other communities, it was taboo to have them hanging out. Anything menstrually related is completely taboo. So they, what do you do about that? And the white, same problem. Stains would be a problem, and there's no bleach. So amazing volunteers got together and they said, what do we do? This is what they did. They made this innovative solution. It's a trifold pad that looks like a handkerchief when it's flat, dries quickly, and when folded in three is a colorful, absorbent, six-layer miracle. 
And what's equally amazing about it is listening to their input and gathering the genius of those we work with and those we serve ended up meaning that these washed with one quarter the amount of water, one quarter. And that's huge in almost all the areas we are, we are in. And then the volunteers were willing to change and change and change to whatever the thousands of women gave feedback that their need was. It's a miracle in what I like to call questioneering. Because after all, how can we be relevant? How can we be culturally, physically, and environmentally responsive if we don't ask those we serve what works for them? Their wisdom is as great or greater than ours. So these volunteer networks have taken us all across the globe. From, this is a group from Australia who took them to Madagascar. And they help in another way, too. They teach people to make their own. Girls and women all over the globe are learning to make their own. A dear friend of mine, Diana, in Uganda, now makes a living making pads and teaching others to make pads. I want to introduce you to another amazing hero. Her name is Gotsu, and she's the second from the right. Gotsu is 12 years old, or was when she learned about Days for Girls. We train something amazing called Ambassadors of Women's Health who go into the world and are taught how to talk about a period because let's be honest, we don't even feel comfortable talking about that here. And what are we afraid of? Because after all, without periods, there would be no people. <laughs> it's an amazing, amazing phenomenon that humans share. Not just the women, all of us share. So this girl got to hear an ambassador in her own language in Zimbabwe come to her and talk to her about this and teach her how to make pads and leave resources and see who it was that picked up the ball. It was 12-year-old Gotsu. And when they returned in six months, they found she had taught 200 fellow students how to make their own pads. And when they asked her, how did you do that? Her response, I am no longer an orphan. I am a leader of women. That is the power of respecting and honoring those we serve. Here's the amazing thing. We know that the poverty cycle can be broken when girls stay in school. And they don't always get that opportunity. A lot of them drop out. And guess what one of the big reasons is? In Uganda, we questioned a school that had had kids for just one year. And they, before we got there, had a pattern of 25% of the girls dropping out when they reached the age of menstruation. One year after having their kids, and guess how many dropped out? 3%. It has a major impact, and yet we know if a girl stays in school even one more year of primary school, according to several studies, that she will, her whole nation will have a higher gross national product. She will have less, be less likely to marry early. She will be less likely to die in childbirth, and she will be more likely to teach her, to her children and lift her community with her voice and talents. We can literally help reverse the cycle of poverty. And I'm not saying this is the only solution, because all good solutions weave together in this magical tapestry that humanity can create together if we don't tie down those within our circle. And the amazing thing is we've left 50% of them, entire communities and nations, locked behind doors. And that affects all of us. The more amazing thing is we can change this. We can do this. This is one of the things we can really do. You know, questioneering isn't alone to Days for Girls. In fact, two of my heroes in the whole world are Dr. Pedro Sanchez, who's a leading soil scientist, and he is a master questioner. He goes into communities and asks them how it's going, why the, how it's, they're addressing eroding soils and failing crops, and in one community, community in Kenya, they answered, well, 
we have to cut down the indigenous trees. If we don't, then our family won't live, and then we can't take care of them into the future. There is no future. So he created, taught them how to grow fast-growing trees that in the first year provided shade, and in the second year could be cut to provide firewood. He found little diminutive sunflowers that could be ground up and amended into the soil right where they were and increased productivity of the crops by an enormous amount. Or Dr. Catherine Bertini, who's one of the World Food Program's former directors. This amazing woman asked questions of an Afghan community and she asked them to list the 10 things they would do if they had more financial resources. And they noticed a pattern. The women, if asked 10 things, would list nine to 10 things that they, they would be involving giving to their community and giving to their families. Very little for themselves. So they took the novel approach of taking the friends, funds or, and food and giving it to the military and instead giving that to the women in the community the women in the community were encouraged to make these brick uh, clay ovens, and they would bake the grains into bread, which would feed the community and trickle down through everyone, benefit financially as well. It was so successful that the Taliban tried to stop the program and not allow the women to do any more baking. She stood them toe to toe and won, but that's another story. What's interesting is both of these people won the World Food Prize. It's the Nobel Prize equivalent sorry, of, for those who change world hunger. Dr. Sanchez and Catherine Bertini put their money from their prize towards secondary education for girls. Dr. Sanchez says it might surprise you that a soil scientist would do that. But here's the quote he gave. An educated girl can have a profound impact on the development of a community. All of them come back. Do you feel the thread? Do you see the thread? We can do this. What's important is not just this issue, but all of us. This begs the question, what other questions are we not asking? If this single issue could have such an enormous impact with so many layers. What other questions have we not asked yet? Is that as exciting to you as it is to me? <laughs> Our goal is to have it done by 2022. Every girl, everywhere, has access to whatever solution works for her. We'll see what we take on next, because we're going to make it, but not without being tenaciously flexible and fearlessly partnering. You're invited. We can, we must reach every girl, everywhere, period. <laughs> Thank you.